Great. Well, welcome everyone, and uh, thanks for joining us at this uh, at this special time for this colloquium. Uh, today, I'm delighted to introduce Professor Reinhard Genzel. Uh, Reinhard is visiting us from the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics, uh, where he's the director, and he's actually en route back from uh, Berkeley, where he is also on the faculty in the Department of Physics. Reinhard is an experimental astrophysicist who's pioneered many sensitive new instruments in the infrared through the submillimeter. And he's studied in particular the central regions of galaxies. This is including, included increasingly detailed studies of stellar orbits in the galactic center, and, uh, and this work has led to the, the most compelling evidence we have today for the existence of supermassive black holes. He's received a number of awards in recognition of these contributions, including the Balzan Prize, the Shaw Prize in, after, in Astronomy, the Crawford Prize, and the Herschel Medal of the Royal Astronomical Society. And I think that it's uh, fairly self-evident that all of these achievements grew out of the few years that he spent here at the CFA as a postdoc. During <laughs> 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 that time, uh, he, was, he was studying uh, 22 gigahertz DLBI, uh, which in Moran, and also uh, infrared studies of galactic star forming <clears throat> regions. So this is actually not so crazy that uh, what he'll talk about today is in some sense merging those two. And he'll tell us about the uh, recent and, and really extraordinary efforts to enable high-resolution astronomy with infrared interferometry. Thank you. Yep, it does feel like coming home. It does. Yeah, Jim, I, I remember I was giving a talk here. George B. Field was somewhere here uh, 39 years ago, uh, presenting the result of our four-year effort to measure proper motions of mesos. Uh, and so, you know, you can put what you said in positive terms, also in negative terms, you know. I had a good start. Uh, and since then, it's been steadily going down. My highest cited paper is my, my diploma thesis. You know, that's what you do as your master's in Germany. It's still the highest cited paper, yeah. And, 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 and these maser cloudlets and movement. But what else are we doing now than measuring little maser cloudlets? Okay, they're just stars. Anyhow, now... Of course, uh, uh, one of my uh, great colleagues was here just two weeks ago, so I'm a little bit in a, in a slightly tight spot to, to pick what might be of interest and not repeat everything he, he has said. There will be some, uh, you know, some repeats here, but hopefully also elements of uh, what you haven't heard. In particular, Jim gave me some questions, and I'm, you know, which I guess Frank hadn't answered or you were wondering anyhow, so I'm trying to uh, address these questions also. It is really, I, I would say, it's remarkable what's, what's been happening in the last two years. Um, everyone, of course, knows radio interferometry. That's what you do if you do radio astronomy. But not so with infrared astronomy, and uh, I'll show you why... Uh, that might be and how one can overcome it and that we have perhaps taken the first small step towards turning uh, uh, infrared optical interferometry into a technique which everyone should think about. <clears throat> so, of course, the motivation for us, anyhow, to enter this was a long-standing program we've had for 28 years where we image stars in the galactic center with ever better uh, resolution and, and uh, precision. Uh, something which we started uh, when I went to Germany I, with Towns in Berkeley, we had looked at uh, gas motions in the galactic center and had found evidence for a central mass. But it was clear that this was not a definitive piece of evidence because gas, you can push around with magnetic fields, winds, and so forth. So if you really want to have solid probes of gravity, stars seemed the way to go. And, of course, that meant going to the near-infrared. Optical is out because of the extinction to the galactic center. Near-infrared. And then, of course, uh, at the time, it was very difficult to find good enough detectors. So uh, a, a very important point was... Uh, uh, the time around the launch uh, of space telescope NICMOS, because then a detector became available which was sensitive enough that one could detect stars in the galactic center in, say, half a second or a few hundred milliseconds. Why is that important? Well, that's sort of the time of stability of the atmosphere, 
And so you can take images where uh, the, the, the seeing has not yet distorted and removed all the diffraction limited information. And so for us, really, it all started not in the VLT that didn't exist at the time, but a precursor telescope, four meter class telescope nearby. Uh, uh, the NTT, the New Technology Telescope, and we built the first speckle camera. This was in 1991, and uh, ESO let us actually use that at the telescope, which was rare. ESO is not an experimental facility usually, but it wants to have its own user instruments on, on the telescope. And so we started then, and the leader of the project then was uh, Andreas Eckhart, and, and and we, we said we could m see motions of stars uh, in a few years, and we did, actually. At the same time, Andrea, yes, having done her thesis uh, in speckle astronomy on young stars uh, with Gary Neugebauer, moved to UCLA, and Eric Becklin convinced her to do the same thing, which is to work with the instrumentalists uh, on the Keck, uh, Keith Matthews, for instance, then also Mark Morris joined, and so they started their effort on the Keck telescope a few years later. By 96 in our case and 98 on their case, we had the first motions of stars on the sky showing fairly good evidence that there was a central few million solar mass uh, uh, object. Now, must it be a black hole? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And this, as you will see, will be a bit of my theme in this talk, and I apologize to those of you who have otherwise strong opinions. I take a very, very, uh, shall we say, high standards of what a proof is. Uh, so at that time, we, we proved that there was a mass of a few million uh, plausibly within the central, say, 0.1 parsec. So that's pretty good evidence but it's definitely not decisive uh, evidence. So when we had that and the Keck group also got the same result, we were mightily proud, but we started thinking, what, what can we do better? What, what is it, what limits us? Well, what limits us is really the number of stars and also that we were statistically measuring the motions by velocity dispersion. Remember, if you me measure motions, you can measure the motions on the sky, that's two coordinates. You can measure the space, uh, the, the coordinate on the sky, that's another two coordinates. But to fully determine the orbit, you need six. You can measure the radial velocity if the star has a spectrum, and you have five, you're still missing one, which is the Z coordinate. So the Z coordinate we didn't have, and therefore you can only argue through statistics, and so that is like a square root of n effect, so that makes it very hard to make very precise measurements. So we need orbits, orbits for individual stars. We made simulations, and they all took a few hundred years, and that it clearly was even too long for Max Planck directors. <laughs> and then we got lucky, both of us, uh, in that we had one star, which showed curvature. The Keck group discovered that first. And then in 2002, when we made the move to the next instrument and the VLT, uh, so we had built with MPA uh, the first adaptive optics camera. So now we went from 0.15 arc second resolution to 50 milli arc second resolution. Uh, and we had much sharper and, and deeper images. And so in 2002, we actually saw uh, how one of the stars actually took the turn. That was fantastic. You don't need a Bayesian analysis for this. You just take a graph paper and, and it sort of sketch in an ellipse and sort of a few angles. And, and sure enough, 4 million solar masses was inside of that. And, and the, the peri distance of that star is, to, is 16 light hours. So that's about uh, 300 astronomical units. So you're down now on the scale of the solar system. And if you uh, use v squared r over g or the other way around, we're talking about an object which moves there at about 8,000 kilometers per second. So that's pretty good and pretty close. At that point, the constraint was already good enough to throw out various proposed other typically astronomical solutions. Like you could have a, a cluster, I mean, not very likely, but certainly possible solutions like a cluster of neutron stars, a few million of those, or a cluster of a few hundred thousand stellar black holes, or something like this. This you could all exclude. But was it a black hole? Absolutely not. Not good enough. So here we were, mightily proud uh, of all of our achievements in 2002 and three. Both groups had gotten the same result again. Um, what could we do next? 
And that's when, in fact, at least on our side, it was clear we've got to get closer to the object and we've got to be able to measure still more precisely. How could we do this? Well, what about interferometry? And so by about 2004, we started seriously thinking about it. In 2005, we proposed to ESO to build a machine called Gravity to them. We, we, it was sort of a room like this with about 100 people. I, I recall most of them looked either angry or, or, or they laughed. Because the people in there, I was the classical infrared interferometry community, which was used to looking at very bright objects, which you could fringe track on and, and so forth. And they said, uh, <laughs> what? 17th magnitude? <laughs> uh, so that, that is the challenge uh, we had a, ahead of us to build things which went so much deeper than anything which was uh, possible at the time. Now before, you know, now we, we are in 2005, we're beginning to uh, think about gravity, at which point we already had another new development on the telescope called Symphony, which was uh, the second of our integral field units we built. Uh, and Symphony uh, does spectroscopy, but across a field at the same time. So it's wonderfully suited to put it behind adaptive optics. Then you get you know, a, a diffraction limited deep spectroscopy with an eight meter telescope. Symphony has been a gorgeous instrument for all kinds of purposes, in particular also high redshift galaxies. Okay, so it's not only the galactic center, but that was a, one of our uh, motivations. Now, of course, as you well know, in, 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 in interferometry and in, 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 ad in adaptive optics, you need to have a bright object to track your phases on and flatten the wavefronts, and that is very rare. So on the way, the next thing we did is to develop a uh, laser guide star uh, facility, uh, the, the first one. It's not anymore on the telescope. And then, uh, really, we were in shape to measure uh, orbits well enough so that by you know, a few years ago, we had a measurement of a few percent accuracy, 5%, 10% accuracy of the central mass. We knew that the extended mass outside of the S2 orbit was only a few percent, and that the radio compact source, Sagittarius A star, is coincident with that, black, with that mass to within a milli arc second. And then Mark Reed uh, showed that from, from uh, uh, motions, or rather not motions, of Sag A star relative to quasars, that the motion of Sag A star itself uh, in the local reference frame was less than a few kilometers per second while the stars were buzzing around there with up to a few thousand. Clearly, that looks like an elephant. It might be an elephant. Is it an elephant? No. So we're not good enough. You have to still, still work harder. Now, in the frometry, okay, take two telescopes and you look at a star at some wavelength with, on, a, on a certain baseline. What you've got to do to get uh, uh, coherence uh, in, a, in a simple adding in the frometer, you have to first compensate for that path length difference. Now, in the, in the radio, uh, you do this, of course, in waveguides or in, in cable or, or whatever else, not so in the optical. So the first thing you encounter is the, now you have to do everything in free space. Uh, in the case of VLT, what you have, you will see that, is you have the, the VLTs up to 130 meters uh, in path length difference on, I mean, baseline. Uh, and then there is a tunnel underneath. In the tunnel, you have little carriages uh, running along to compensate for the uh, optical path length difference on the object given the uh, you know, time of, of, of night, etc. So that's, that's delta here. So it's much more effort to generate this delta than, uh, than you, you have in, in the radio. The next problem is the coherence time of the atmosphere. That's a real big one because the coherence time of the atmosphere and the radio is you know, minutes or even longer. Here we have one millisecond time, and then the fringe is gone. So that's really a challenge. So if you want to you know, quantify this a little bit, as I tried in this little formula, uh, which is the ratio of difficulty to achieving coherent detection per baseline, like in here, uh, between infrared and radio. So anything which is large means it's more difficult than the infrared. The first thing is the coherence time. There it is which is a, you know, a, a large factor right there. The next one is this here, which is the 
size of the fringe, if you like. Okay? Now, we have the advantage in the infrared that we have very broad bandwidth. You will see that later. That makes us very sensitive. But that means that the size of the fringe is correspondingly smaller. Delta lambda over lambda, right? Is, 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 is large, therefore the fringe is very much smaller. So this factor, again, is a, is a very large factor because the fringes are small uh, in phase space, in real space as well as in time space. Then there are some advantages and or disadvantages. In the radio, you are at, at short frequencies, so that's, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's good for the radio, that's bad for, for infrared. Uh, but then you look at very bright sources, typically, synchrotron sources or masers, which have very high brightness temperatures. Not so in the optical or infrared. There you're looking at thermal uh, sources. So this factor sort of more or less compensates. You're looking at uh, objects which are intrinsically uh, fainter, but then, you know, you do it at, 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 at higher frequencies. And then finally, this one is sort of a, a, you know, a factor telling you something about efficiencies. And unfortunately, and I think Frank showed you the movie, I won't do that today, how we torture the photons. Um, and there's only about half a percent left uh, and not died along the path uh, when they reach the detector. So radio interferometry is more efficient. So you put this all together, about a 10 to the 5 difference. So Charlie Towns, in his life biography, if you like, in annual reviews, sort of summarized how, how, what he wanted to do in the rest of his life. And he was only 90, very young man, and, and ready to do the last uh, 10 years. And so he said, well, the first and most important thing is to look at the galactic center with interferometry. Now, he built an interferometer, 10 micron interferometer, a very important uh, device. Uh-oh. Um, but he didn't see anything. And not in the galactic center. That was really very sad for him. And the reason is exactly that is that, you know, it's just too difficult uh, to do that, and especially at 10 microns, I should say, where you then have uh, additional, additional noise. The next factor is imaging interferometry. So now, so far, I've talked about one baseline. The next one is, of course, very well known. That's how uh, uh, the Nobel Prize was uh, given, is the fact that you can combine the different baselines to get n times n minus 1 over 2 combinations in the UV plane and thereby improve the number of samplings so that when you do the Fourier transforming, your beam becomes decent if n is large. That you cannot do in the infrared. Why? Well, because in the radio, you have uh, uh, amplifiers which can amplify the electric field strength before detection without loss. Not so in the infrared. And if you put some uh, such device uh, in the laboratory, Towns had a PhD thesis for that. Uh, Bob Boyd uh, built, built such an amplifier. You get horrific noise that's called quantum noise. Uh, and so it's not very efficient. So we cannot amplify. Therefore, the more telescopes you use, the less signal on each baseline you get. So in a way, actually, the four telescope, uh, uh, you know, VLT is sort of an optimum. You know, could, I could imagine a five telescope. Labory once proposed a VLA 24. I think it's, it's not going to work because the sensitivity per baseline is going to be so bad. Uh, that you're really not looking at faint signs. And that's, that's the trick. Because if you can't do, uh, if, uh, you know, faint signs, things which are extragalactic or very small, uh, little sources in star clusters, or something like this, then most of the astronomy community are not going to be on your side. So that's why in the, uh, infrared and optical interferometry has not been very successful. That's right. Yeah. No, that comes in positive because uh, you know by cooling things down, then you can get very low noise, so, so to speak. On the noise performance, you actually can gain, right? So this is on the noise performance, you're doing very well. I mean, can't have that all in there. So that actually enters here at at some at some level, right? Uh, so that's that's in favor of the infrared optical. Uh, but all the amplification issues are so negative on the, on the infrared. Okay, so now we understand that. Finally, then, this is actually the ESO VLT and the UV coverage of the four telescope and the so-called dirty beam, which is the Fourier transform of this uh, UV coverage. And you see, actually, it's not so bad. Why? 
because of our large bandwidth. So a radio interferometer would have very narrow streaks here because the bandwidths are so narrow. Whilst we have a 0.3, uh, you know, d delta nu over nu uh, relative bandwidth, and that means that we actually, each baseline has a long streak in your UV coverage. And so the, base, the UV coverage is not that bad, and so the beams are pretty good. So it's in the galactic center, we get a, a two and a half times four milli arc second beam. So that was the first answer to Jim's uh, question, why, uh, why, why that? The next one is, of course, what did we do in gravity to overcome this? And I don't want to go through the details of this extremely complicated instrument. It's really extremely complicated. I know there was an earlier picture of Frank. Let's go back to this. Uh, this is uh, how we started. There you go. That was about two years after this started gravity, and then uh, we have a pic you, you saw Frank here, so you can vouch for me that I'm correct, and that's uh, uh, Frank now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that really is not only the delta T in time. This is really, it, 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 it manifests itself in the complexity of this uh, development. So the first thing you have to do is you have to really make sure that at the frequency where you're sampling the fringes as well as the adaptive optics, both are key elements, you must have no noise extra from the instrument. So that, that means you cannot have large read noise at a kilohertz, which is the, the coherence time. These such detectors did not exist when we started, and we, 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 we had two developments going together with ESO. In the end, remarkably, the European one from this company in the UK, Celex one and so we have now a, a detector with one, read, one electron read noise at a kilohertz. We're currently, and this is an imaging detector, I should say. So these are basically avalanche uh, uh, diode-type systems, uh, but now as an imaging detector, a few hundred pixels times a few hundred pixels. Uh, we are currently building a you know, 10, 20 times bigger system with still lower read noise, both for the VLT but also for upgrades of of gravity. The next one is compact cryo optics. If you would have visited the VLT or any other uh, optical interferometer, what you would see is large and numbers of mirrors on benches, optics, uh, bulk optics. Well, that's warm optics, has background noise, uh, vibrations, and so forth. We decided to go into a door once you are at the beam combination laboratory. Therefore, we can go do compact uh, cryo optic. It means we are at low temperature, no vibrations, and then we go into fibers where we can immediately filter. See, in interferometry, you only are sensitive to one mode of the photons. But the adaptive optics delivers N modes because it's not, co not you know, perfect. Strain ratios are high with our system, but not 100%. So you get a lot of incoherent uh, signals, which then end up uh, producing noise. So by filtering, right away as you go into the door, you are, you're pushing down on the, on the, on the fringe and, and uh, phase detection uh, uh, noise. Next, uh, the beam combination. Well, that uh, radio astronomers know. I mean, you do that, of course, in, 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 in chips. Not so for optical interferometry until uh, this and an earlier instrument. This is a development at Grenoble to basically have a chip about this size in which you come in with four telescopes, four beams, and then you do all the combinations and all the samplings like in radio astronomy, and you come out with 24 output uh, channels where you have the signals. That's a very high, high performance way of doing this. Um, the next one is uh, Phase reference external fringe tracking. No, uh, the galactic center, no of the stars, and certainly not the black hole, is bright enough to track fringes on. So you need to have an object in the field uh, where you can track the fringes on in a millisecond. And so in the galactic center, very, very lucky that we have one star which is five arc seconds away where we can do the adaptive optics. So that's flattening the wave wavefronts. And then there is a star of about 10th magnitude, one arc seconds away, within the field of view of the interferometer, which we can use to track the fringes on. And then we have roughly, so to speak, we are phase stable. We can correct for the difference between this one arc second difference. And then we know where to look 
and then we go and integrate with a second fiber directly on the object of interest. And that makes all the difference in the galactic center because then this limit of detecting in one millisecond is irrelevant. So in, this has been the limit of interferometry. We are now taking images, as you will see, at K of 21. So that's 11 magnitudes uh, deeper. Strain ratio high, high quality laser metrology, so we're sending lasers back to the telescopes and measure all the differences and so forth. And then, of course, we, we have various uh, modes, imaging, spectroscopy, polarization, all in one. Um, how likely was that the instrument would have worked? About 10 minus 3. <laughs> it's really, I mean, we've built some difficult instruments, but this was it. And Frank Eisenhower really has been the, the star on, of this, and you've seen him. Uh, it has cost him, but I mean, it's really been an absolutely wonderful collaboration with colleagues at the Max Planck Institute uh, for Astronomy, uh, at the Institute uh, in Grenoble, in Observatoire de Paris, Cologne University, ESO, and in Porto in Portugal. So all of these have contributed ma major things to to gravity. And sometimes you're lucky enough that when you make a, 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 a jump in, 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 in instrumentation, that at the same time you are able to sort of start using that on various things. And that happens already with gravity now. So here's a, a little cartoon series of our first successes. Uh, Frank talked about, and I will of course summarize that again, the galactic center work here on the star S2 and uh, the flare motions near the last stable orbit, but that's just one part. There is, I will briefly mention that too, uh, we have for the first time resolved, spatially resolved, broad light, the broadline region spectral, spectrally in a rotating broadline region of 3C273. Here is the famous uh, uh, CFA2 galaxy, which has always been used, and you know it, to, to argue for, you know, a, a unified model of uh, dust and gas distributions as AGN where we were supposed to find a torus of uh, hot dust. Now, what we see there may be not so clear, but here we are seeing basically these blue things are clumps of very hot dust, and the mazes line up on the right flank of those. And the nucleus is right here in the center where you can see the radio continuum. So the picture, we have an edge on disk, thin, just like the mazes. Uh, so no torus. Um, some of our colleagues won't like that so much, I know, but, but, but that's what we find. So there are other things which we did expect, like, for instance, beautiful work on uh, multiplicity in uh, uh, high mass star forming uh, regions, uh, then gas flows, very complex gas flows in good old friends like SS433 or Eta Carina, uh, where we have spectroscopic imagery, okay, uh, of detailed uh, structures. And then finally, something which, you know, you didn't expect at all. Writes one day, Sylvester Lecour on the team, you guys with your AGNs and and galactic center black holes, I have something much better. I have exoplanet spectra. And here's one of them. That's beta pic B, where the second uh, is already now accepted for publication. And these spectra, I'm told, is significantly better than what's uh, been possible so far. Why? Well, because interferometers are filters. So the coherent speckles, which play coronagraphs, if you have not 100% strail ratio, are not seen by the interferometer. It's just blended out, doesn't know it. So the noise is lower, okay? The, the tr tr transmission is also lower, but the noise is lower, and so that's why this is possible. So, I mean, it has lots to do now. Uh, already this year, the VLT as a whole will use about 15, 17% of its time on interferometry. That's a, that's, a, that's a proof that something has happened. And we can do more, I come back to this at the end. Now, let's go to strong gravity and, and, and things which also are near and dear to your hearts. And, and of course, uh, this is really a set of steps, in my view. 
from mm, pretty easy to ever more difficult. So from pretty easy in the post-Newtonian world where maybe some of your colleagues say, why are you doing this? I mean, everyone knows that GR is correct at post-Newtonian 1 level or something like this, to the most difficult where in eventually you want to really prove that something is truly a, a curve black hole quantitatively. And I'll come back to this. I think that's very, very difficult. I want to point that out. It's very, very difficult, and one should not take this lightly. And I'll take you, to, take you to the first two steps, some of which actually went faster than we thought. So here we are looking at the star S2 in 2018. We knew that. That, in fact, determined how when we had to deliver gravity. 2005, remember, we had proposed gravity. Uh, and then we knew, okay, the star is going to come back in 2018 for its next parry. We've got to be at the telescope, and then we can measure with interferometry and, and spectroscopy the orbit much more precisely, and that allows us to get PPN1 uh, spectrally and perhaps also astrometrically. So that's the gravitational redshift, and that's the Schwarzschild precession. That's what we had early on. So in fact, that's the first paper by Eckhart et al. in 93. That's the first speckle image where, in addition to stars which all were known, there was something near Sir J star. And so one of these blobs, which you can't really know, that's S2, turns out. Uh, of course, at the time, we didn't know what it was. And, and so uh, this has then turned into a sort of a, a standard method for the Keck group and ours. So we followed this. Here is our first image uh, underneath here. That's 92. Uh, the red symbols, that's speckle times. Uh, here was the first parry, which I described to you, both groups seeing clearly that there was a, a pointed mass, and it went out again, uh, and then coming around. And here we are, starting with gravity in 2017, catching this entire uh, key part of the, of the orbit around uh, parry. And the key thing is that the confusion, I mean, first of all, you measure more precisely by a factor of 10 or more. And the second one is you'll suffer much less confusion. I don't know whether you see this, but the star in 2018 is a little elliptical. It's a little extended. Why is that? Because Sagittarius star emits all the time, but it varies up and down. You don't know how much, but it pulls the... Uh, the centroid of the emission with adaptive optics by a few percent. And that's enough to basically make your measurement in 2018 terms or post-2018 terms useless. Before, of course, we were quite happy about that. But now I think the standards have gone up. Uh, it's just not good enough to measure to a milli arc second. We now want to measure to 50 micro arc seconds and, and better. And in fact, that has been done by gravity. Here's the deepest gravity image. Uh, this is an eight-hour exposure in 2018, um, uh, where the RMS noise is 21.1. So that's more than 10,000 times fainter than previous. But you do see there is still noise in here, which is not thermal noise. So we are not at the end. We still have to understand more. There we are probably very similar shaped in the, uh, as you are. I mean, we, we, we're still not, we still don't understand the system well enough to get rid of all of the systematics, which, which we need to, if you wanted to go still further and see stars inside of uh, the S2 orbit, which we would love to do in order to measure the spin, which you cannot do with S2. So that's, that's sort of uh, gravity imaging. And so where we used to, with adaptive optics, measure the motion from maybe on, on few months scale or yearly scale, here we can do it from day to day. Uh, so the motion near Perry, here's Perry on the 19th of, of May last year. So here you see the motions about 500 micro arc seconds per day. So that's easy. Okay, it's easy. And... Uh, and you, you can therefore really precisely measure the, the orbit uh, of, of the star astrometrically. Now, PPN1, gravitational redshift, is an effect which is seen in wavelength space. It's redshift, right? So what you have on top of the orbital excursion in velocity space, which you see here measured with symphony uh, on these lines of, of bracket gamma, hydrogen, and helium, uh, there is a little extra component due to general relativity uh, which we want to get. So you could say, of course, 
Why do we need interferometry? The effect is in wavelength space. And indeed, that's what we all thought. We too. For us, the interferometry was a general uh, step of, of progress because we wanted to get at the uh, Schwarzschild precession. But only in about March last year, around this time, 12 months ago, did we begin to realize how degenerate the problem was. Because if you don't have the orbit nailed to sub uh, percent accuracy, then there are degenerate Keplerians, which you can junk, you know, junk around, which look in velocity space just like the GR solution, uh, um, which, which you pick. So you must be able to exclude that, and for that you need gravity. Okay, this is, this is an example of the... Uh, the improvement in, in, in determination of, of parameters, I'm sure Frank showed this. Here as an example, the period. So after the first time when the star came around, we knew it to a half a year, and now we know it to nine hours. So that's sort of a, you know, a very a good set of Im improvements, nine hour uh, accuracy of prediction. So what do we need to do? Already a decade ago, Tal Alexander, who unfortunately passed away last year, before he has, had seen the result, uh, had done quite a bit of work to, sh to look into what you would have to do with gravity or, or symphony and so forth to get the various post-Newtonian terms. The first one you need to take care of at all times is the Rimmer effect, of course. That's the, just a light travel time. In fact, uh, it's, it's remarkable. I, I, I learned only two weeks ago, we can now measure the distance to the galactic center only with gravity because of the Rimmer effect. Okay, we don't need the spectrometer. I didn't know that until very recently. Uh, but uh, the set, and then the third, the PPN1 beta squared effect here, uh, there it is, is the sum of the tangential Doppler uh, plus the gravitational redshift. They're about equal and to together about 200 kilo, kilo, kilometers per second. So that's what GR would tell you on S2 what you should see. Then we come to lens tearing, sort of spin. And you see now we are talking about one kilometer per second. Now that's out of, of any option with, with uh, the star S2. We measure typically per spectrum to an accuracy of 8 to 10 kilometers per second. So even if you make 100 measurements, you will not get to that level. So that's out for S2. Here is... The Shapiro effect, that's of course are out as well, although it's bigger, but it's out. So we really can, with spectroscopically, only get to uh, PPN1. Uh, I come back to, to the uh, Schwarzschild position. I don't want to dwell too much on the, ta on, on the different techniques. Probably Frank did that. So in the end, what we did is just a brute force, MC, MC, uh, Bayesian, inference on 14 parameters and all their correlations. And here is the term which basically represents the, uh, the PPN1. So we can measure that to, you know, 5%. So that's, that's the act. That's, yeah. in, in the paper, which may, you may have seen, we reported to 10%, but that was half of the year. So we added more accuracy at the end of the year. And here you see the residuals relative to Kepler here in spectral. You see how we nicely see the excursion due to the, the gravitational redshift and transverse Doppler. Here are the residuals uh, in, in uh, astrometry, and, and, and there I want to point out to you some very nasty things with the adaptive optics, which we only realize now. If you look here, the, the residu residuals are not Gaussian distributed. And that is something which, again, adds all of a sudden a dimension of concern on the adaptive optics measurement, which we didn't know. They have some very significant longer-term excursions here. In fact, we know from the Keck group, where we weren't measuring here, this thing goes up like this. Uh, what, what's, what's, what's happening? What's happening is little mice <laughs> are creeping into the images, which is 17th magnitude stars. They go in their little way. And you don't know that, right? until you see all of a sudden the combined centroid uh, to move a little bit for a year or two. Then they're gone, the mice are gone. Sometimes you find them when they're coming out, oops, there it goes. And then you go backwards and you know that the mice, the mouse was there. So it's confusion, unfortunately. Uh, at that level of accuracy, really, you have to worry about these confusion uh, events which we didn't really know about. 
And I mentioned the key conclusion here, although the effect uh, is, is in wavelength space, gravity is essential if you want to have that kind of proof uh, as we have it now if it's for removing the degeneracies. Now, Schwarzschild. Well, we knew uh, we, we'd, we would need some time to measure Schwarzschild. Since the orbit is very elliptical, and the Schwarzschild, the strength of the Schwarzschild precession term strongly depends on radius, more or less all of the 11.9 arc minutes of the Schwarzschild uh, precession occurs in the innermost part of the orbit. It's like a kink. So you come in on a Kepler, then you go in, then you kink to another Kepler, and you go back out. So it's not that you're precessing slowly over the orbit, which, which would happen in a circular orbit. Uh, so in fact, uh, here is the sort of the residual of uh, zero here of, in our index of uh, uh, no Schwarzschild or Kepler. So that's zero here, and that's our data, and that's the prediction of Schwarzschild. So you see the effect is basically this angle here. That's the 11.9 arc minutes, so to speak, coming up. <laughs> so we haven't gotten the detection yet. Formally, the data do, do look a little bit like there is something, but it's still less than one sigma. So it'll take at least this year and maybe next year, and then we hope to have a, a significant uh, detection on the Schwarzschild position. Part two, the flares. So the black hole, I told you, is visible all the time, more or less. And we know for many years, and, and Giovanni, you have worked on that as well with Spitzer, uh, that this emission is characterized by excursions of up to two orders of magnitude uh, of, a, of a completely red spectrum noise uh, uh, source which is, is, is really perfectly random. There is no preferred time scale. Initially, we thought there was preferred time scale in there, but there aren't if you statistically analyze the most recent paper on this is by Witzel uh, et al. Uh, but from the beginning, when thinking about what these things could be due to, we knew was synchrotron emission, polarized synchrotron emission, uh, we felt, well, uh, how can you generate these excursions? And it was very clear it's not an issue of more material falling in. It's not m dot. It's the energy of the electrons. Most of the electrons are at gamma of one between 10 and 30. They emit uh, radio millimeter photons. But to get near infrared synchrotron emission, you need gamma of 1,000. So you need to e energize very substantially. And that might mean locally uh, some fraction of the innermost electrons in order to see uh, synchrotron emission in the infrared and even more, a million, to make X-ray emission. Most people think that the X-ray emission is also synchrotron emission. And this picture comes to mind, which was running here all the time, which is a solar flare. So basically, if you're in a magnetically dominated plasma with very strong magnetic field structures, then reconnection could locally uh, energize the electrons by that amount. In fact, the analogy to solar flares holds very well. If you take the energetics of a solar flare and scale it up to the scales of the galactic center, it actually works out pretty well. But I have to say, and we have experts here in the audience, the numerical simulations have not yet confirmed that to any degree of, of really believability. But that's sort of the model we've gone uh, for. So the idea is, could it be what you're seeing here is the formation of highly energetic electrons for a little while due to reconnection or shocks, and that would create hot spots uh, in, a, in a, a region, and the hot spots then for a little while would rotate in the accretion plasma and serve as sort of a tracer of the flow. And that's something which Avi Yu and, and Avery Broderick then actually looked at and, and asked the question, can that be used to infer the kinematics of the innermost region? And the answer is yes, it can, although the clock is really bad because the clock is going kaput amongst, uh, under your fingers because the spot, even if you make it a very, very small, will shear away by differential rotation into an arc within about half to one over. So I recall uh, 10 years ago when, when I happily reported at a dinner to Roger Blanford what we were doing with gravity and the flares, he said, what nonsense are you doing? Uh, I mean, this is not going to work. And indeed, I must say, for in the intermediate years, 
I, we didn't put so much weight on this uh, because it seemed pretty hilarious. But then, uh, there it is. In a, the first flare, a good flare we saw, started at, at this position relative to the black hole. There it is. When the, I should say, during a flare, uh, during a flare, the Sagittarius star becomes very much brighter. Here in this case, about uh, a few hundred times brighter than in the sort of average state. That means you can measure better in shorter periods of time. That's the key thing. Okay, so for the measurement, it's the fact that your astrometry improves, in this case, to 20 micro arc seconds in five minutes. So that's really why, why it is we, we can measure so well. It's because source is bright. And so then it started here. And then in about 40 minutes, it moved around here. The arrow bar is about this, this big. So they are, they are significant. And so this is 40 minutes. Scale is, you know, 150, 200 mil, uh, micro arc seconds. And the speed is about 0.3 C. And it's clockwise motion. So normally the galactic center is, is, is up here, but S2 is down here. So in these flares, which is uh, about probability of 1%, you're down in this, this regime here. So they're not very common. Uh, you can't plan for them. You just have to hope that you'll see them. They take typically an hour or so, and then they're gone, and then you know, something else happens. Uh, so that's sort of the, the mayor, the, the story. Here's your hot spot, which on the scale of the uh, photon orbit or uh, ISCO is like this. And what we saw, we think, is sort of an, an orbit. Now you see what, what's drawn here is a face-on orbit. And in fact, the analysis, the various, various techniques, ray tracing, Reinhardt's spreadsheet, uh, and everything else, it always delivered this up. You see in the, the red and the blue here as a function of time, the excursions in X and Y. And you see, you know, it goes up and goes down goes down and goes up, pretty sinusoidal, as you would expect for a face-on situation. Here's the, here's the fit. Now, I've heard the question several times over the last few days giving this talk, uh, or just conversations. Well, what's the probability for a face-on situation? It's zero, right? Well, it's not, you know, we can't say it's, it's definitely face-on. You will see it's, it's our analysis shows that likely it's less than 30 degrees, so it's not zero probability, but it's not very high. Now comes another thing we saw, which is polarization loops, something Jim is very familiar with. So if you have a polarized cloud due to magnetic fields, then of course the polarization image is perpendicular to the magnetic field. And in most everyone's picture where the magnetic field is in the plane of the plasma in a toroidal fashion. That's what most people feel should be the geometry. Then the, the magnetic field goes like this. That means the polarization should go like this. And if you then look at Q and U, then Q and U loops twice around the, uh, the circle for one orbital period, twice. And so here we have one flare, and here you see the Q and U uh, components, relatively speaking, and within one orbital period, it went, went around once, once. And in two other flares did the same thing. So we are seeing a very regular 360 degree uh, rotation of the polarization of the flares, which also do loops on the sky with the same orbital and the same polarization period. That's, that's not expected. And we think, and this is due to Jason Dexter's work, the reason is, is that we are near face on and we are looking at a poloidal structure. So if you have a pure poloidal field and you look at it face on, then the field is right at you. That means that the polarization is constant. It doesn't vary at all. Now you tip this thing just a little bit, then all of a sudden you get light bending and multiple imagery, and they pull, so to speak, a bit of the bit of the in the other direction, and they make a, du a double loop like the other one. Now, if you go uh, edge on, then actually that component dominates. You can get a double double loop again. But at fa near face on situations, you get sort of a degenerate thing where you get the. That the double part of the loop is a little teeny, and you get a single, single loop. So that's Jason's explanation, and
it is for you to check this, please. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's very clear that, you know, if, if, if that's correct, you should see it also with the Event Horizon Telescope. So here are the various uh, uh, reasons why we think we are near phase on. Uh, reason number one is we don't see in the variability any, any um, periodicity. And that means Doppler boosting doesn't play a strong role. We don't see it in, in the data. And Doppler boosting, of course, is a strong function of inclination. And only if you're less than 30 degrees do you not see a strong variation, uh, boosting, deboosting situation. That's the first one. That's called contrast here. So that puts us in this regime. The next one is the astrometry uh, of, the, of the data puts us roughly in this regime. And the polarization loop is roughly this. So this is sort of the preferred the preferred region, around 30, 20 degrees uh, inclination. So it's not exactly face-on, but it's pretty face-on. Perhaps supporting this is the first 3 millimeter, 86 gigahertz VLBI data from Isaun et al., where you can see shadows, of course, at that wavelength. You have very significant uh, scattering, but the source looks fairly irregular, fairly circular. So either it's a face-on uh, system where the, the, the jet may be then along the line of sight, or it may not have a jet. Uh, that's, that's also a possibility. But if it's a jet, jetted source, as many of us believe, then indeed this circularity would also uh, uh, say it might be face-on. Again, that's something which very much I hope I'm looking forward to AHD data to, to confirm that. So that's the summary of the Galactic Sunday experiment. Uh, if, you, if you plot the inferred radii and periods of the three flares we've seen, they're here. Uh, red is, the, is a set of orbits for a Schwarzschild solution. Here is ISCO going out for 4.1 million solar mass, so as you would expect from the S2 orbit. That's an extreme curve. Uh, prograde is green, an extreme curve, a retrograde, is here. Always the dot here is the ISCO. So, you know, at this point we have, can make the following statements. Both the polarization and the orbital motion gives us sort of this regime here, which is near but little larger than ISCO, apparently, on average, for a Schwarzschild hole. It could be on retrograde uh, curve. You can argue then that this is highly unlikely, and perhaps not so likely on an extreme uh, occur prograde. Uh, now, we can make a me measurement of the mass. Uh, so different masses, of course, would lead to this set of curves to move around here. So if you take the arrows and so forth, this means that the mass in the coordinate speed and, and, and orbital times we measure is between three and, three and five and a half. Okay, so that's sort of our, our accuracy. So that's, that's where the galactic center now stands. We can plot the mass distribution as a function of radius from the outer parts all the way by a factor of a million inside to close to the uh, uh, ISCO uh, in, in the most stable circular orbits. This is when Towns and I wrote in 87, based on the gas measurements, the first detection of the source. This is this, this region here in the, in the upper right. So with the stars and now with the flares, we push this inward with always the same mass. So that looks pretty good, pretty good. And there's no stellar contribution of any significance in this innermost region. Now, there will be some stellar black holes, as I told you. So is it a black hole? No, doesn't have to be. Not good enough. Sorry. I would say we better hang, hang in here because we can say it's consistent with. Yes, we can. But we need more. We need more. We need, if, if we want to prove the Kernis, uh, let me go to this uh, here, we need to do more. So obviously, uh, you guys are engaged in measuring the shape of the photon ring. That's what you want to do, and I really wish you will do it because then you can measure things like the asymmetry uh, or the displacement of, of, the, of the ring, and there is information on uh, the spin parameter as well as 
deviations from the no hair uh, quadrupole moment. Downside is, of course, uh, you need to measure very well. Uh, you need to measure in the percent level, so that's, that's unfortunately the, the, the call for You need to measure very accurately. For us, we want to see the third star, and that gives us the spin directly. Now, we've done simulations, what is required uh, from, from work by... Uh, um, no, uh, uh, Idel Weisberg, and basically, in order to see, with all the parameters we, we know now, to see a lens steering position, the star has to be within a few hundred Schwarzschild radii. So uh, S2 is at peri 15 or 1400, so a factor of t three inside, and we can see this. So far, we have no star, okay, so it's just a speculation. And our plan is we want to push deeper, and then perhaps we see a star, and if it's sufficiently inside, we measure it for a few years, we might be able to measure the spin. Uh, so that, in some uh, paper of, I think this one is Psaltis, Vex, and Kramer, uh, if you can combine everything, so the, the constraints from, from the event horizon, the constraints from stars with a spin, and then perhaps even better if you had a pulsar in here, then you could pr pr uh, pr prove uh, no hair and, and, and currentness, as I call it now, currentness. Yeah? Then you could really see this object really is a, or is not an object which is uh, really described by, by uh, the Kermetric. But I think they'll take a while. I'm, 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 I dare I'm, I'm a little pessimistic and we should, I, I think we should do a good job on it. Um, I have one more slide on the AGNs, but I, I'm pretty much at the end. I, I, I do have two minutes? Uh, oh, I'm two minutes over. Uh, have two minutes. I have two minutes. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, so, um, yeah. So I wanted to summarize on one slide uh, the work on the AGNs um, and show you where we can go with this. So the broadline region in AGNs, as you may recall, is supposed to be a thickish turbulent, but in some cases rotating, certainly virialized set of cloudlets uh, around the AGN on scales of less than a parsec. That we know from many years of observations, including reverberation uh, mapping. Now, reverberation mapping can only give you a statistical description, so we don't, with that technique, measure masses of black holes to high precision. You cannot. You can measure it statistically well, but if you want to do, for instance, a census and then a galaxy black hole evolution, then you cannot do individual black holes. It's not, not possible. With this technique, uh, where you measure the motions of the broadline region by looking at the, the broad, the blue and the red side of the, of the, of an emission line and look for, you know, significant changes in a, in a continuous way, which would indicate a velocity gradient of rotation. And if it's rotating, well, then you can. And indeed, we were lucky that in the first year we saw uh, in the Passion Alpha line, towards 3C273, recall that was the famous first quasar by Martin Schmidt, uh, we saw a phase signature of, you know, a degree or so in, in interferometer phase, which is, in fact, a 10 micro arc second size rota rotating disk, uh, pretty much face on in this, this case. Can a model of this, and then you see you can derive the parameters in particular, you measure already pretty well, uh, 40%, 30% the black hole mass. So that is interesting because the question immediately comes, how many quasars can you do? Uh, that would be interesting to many people. And indeed, with G gravity as it is right now, we can do tens. And we are beginning to do that. I mean, we already are in the process. We have a second rotating broadline region already. Uh, and so we will try and do, to, to sample the, the luminosity function a little bit in order to you know, test the, the reverber, reverberation uh, technique in that way. Uh, I, I, 1068, I already man, uh, ma managed. If you want to go further, we need to do something about gravity, and we need to upgrade it, and that's the last slide. So before gravity, we were at 10.5, and so there are only very few objects as you understand. With gravity, uh, we can do you know, tens of nearby, moderately nearby quasars. That's this cloud here, which is within that limit. 
but also the phase uh, differences in order to resolve the uh, broad line region. So that's the cloud of objects which we will be looking at now, tens of nearby quasars. But of course, we would like to get here where thousands and thousands of objects are, especially at high redshift. Can we get there? Yes, we can. The upgrades we can make is we can, for instance, do a few optical components which we know are not as optimum as they could be in an upgrade there, and that's about a factor of three to four, we feel. Next, we can uh, get a still lower read noise detector. I mentioned we already uh, more or less have it in hand by a factor of two to three. Uh, we can then equ equip all the UTs with laser, laser guide stars. That allows us better wavefront sensing as well as higher uh, strain ratios uh, on the object. That's very important for quasars. So that's, that's a factor of four. Higher strain ratio also improves the injection stability into the, into the fibers by a factor of two. And then finally, one can increase the field of view of the interferometer. That's more invasive for the ESO and do external fringe tracking on stars. Uh, that, that could be another factor of two, in, in particular on objects which are not bright. That would be galaxies instead of uh, Aegean, high redshift, for instance. In any case, if you, if, if you do that, you can get to about K of 15. At K of 15, you have, you can see this here, uh, you know, about a thousand or more local uh, quasars. And if you look down here, you have tens to, okay, I should say, you have tens to about a hundred redshift two objects. So we, are, we will be trying to convince ESO to do this. Uh, and if so, then I think this instrument, upgraded Gravity Plus, might very well be of interest to a larger, a very large community of people and, and really put, put us in the same domain as, as, in, as a radio interferometry. Thank you for your patience. I hope I haven't too much repeated what Frank already told me. Congratulations on uh, making so many breakthroughs on so many fronts. But may I uh, ask you about another break, uh, front that you can make a breakthrough on, which is uh, potentially some of these AGNs may have binary black holes in them. So yes. Can you comment on Absolutely. your ability to separate them? With right. Them? That's been, of course, on our mind. And, <laughs> and I mean, currently, I would say we already have two AGNs in our current sample, which we will look at this year. Um, when you do the upgrade, I think, you know, I would say, a tens of, of binaries. But there will be many. I mean, how do you select that, right? I mean, so the, the, there's the time variability, uh, but then there's also compact radio uh, emission and so forth. So you take these various measures together, then uh, tens. But, but it could be more if, 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 if you know, we, we don't know about uh, systems uh, that they are binary. No, absolutely, you know. You want to study the plastic uh, barbaria. In, in the merger. Yeah. Yeah, again, beautiful work, Reinhard. Uh, hats off to the team. So, and, and it's good that you're being very careful about what's a black hole, whether GR is correct. And it's, it's very important. Um, what, you, what I was waiting for you to mention was uh, alternatives to black holes. So, are there some alternatives? Where do you think we stand on gravistars or boson stars? Are they viable? Do we need to pay attention to them? Yeah. Where do they fit in? No, that's an outstanding uh, question, and I have to say, I'm not a good enough theorist to really put my fingers on. It's clear if you look at the papers which I refer to, they're going through a number of the examples, and there's, uh, you know, some of the the alternative gravity theories uh, predict mass dependence, for instance, uh, of space time. So that would be something you could exclude. Um, Grava stars and and uh, the boson star. Well, I I'm very pessimistic on the Grava star. I mean, you have to come so close in my view to the. I mean, it's essentially at the event horizon, right? Because of LIGO. Also. Yeah, I, even for LIGO. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, the boson star might be a little easier, but as you know from the the, the Red Solar Group's paper, you know, even even uh, the ring. This doesn't necessarily see a difference between a. I mean, it's, it's in there, right? It's within your radius, so you know you you're very sen you're not very sensitive. 
If you had orbits which go in, then maybe, but then then those stars would be disrupted. So I would have to say I'm not very optimistic. On the, on the other hand, of course, you could say Occam's razor kills that one. I mean, it's, it's you know, if you have a boson star, it'll accrete baryons, and then, you know, sure enough, pretty soon it's a curb line one, right? I mean, so you can be flopsick about it. <laughs> I'm just wondering, you, you've done this on the VLT, these, these eight meter telescopes. Is there any room, frankly, for the smaller custom interferometers that we developed? Say? Three magnitudes. Yeah. Three magnitudes. Okay, we have that on the mountain. We use it, in fact, for, for installations. And it's being used by quite a bit of the stellar work. So the, the bright case work is actually AT work. Uh, but as soon as you want to have the the faint stuff, that three magnitude, you cannot miss. You, you can't get some of it back from um, fewer reflections and higher throughput? A little bit, yeah. yeah. But not the full, not, not three magnitude. Not the full <laughs> three magnitude. Yeah. Okay, well, let's see how the future questions uh, just come up after the talk. Okay. Thank you.